All right. So before I move into um, our case, I'm going to go over some modeling for this debate since it's sort of vague and we have to talk about what this looks like, right? We think that like prestigious U.S. firstly on like what it means to graduate from a prestigious U.S. university is like generally pretty clear. We're going to say that's like a T20 school. Like this includes like all pretty much all the Ivies, like schools like Northwestern, U Chicago, MIT, like these types of schools where they offer 100% need-based aid. So you basically have no debt coming out of college, especially compared to other college graduates. And these sorts of schools tend to have the highest um, incomes coming out of college as well. Then on to discretionary income, we're going to say that is any income you get beyond what is necessary for the physical and emotional well-being for you and your family. For example, um, uh, money for food, taxes, medicine, child support, rent, utilities, transportation, and property maintenance is not discretionary income, but something that is discretionary income is like, for instance, like instead of buying a fancy new car, you would buy one that's like cheaper, um, probably use one that's still functional and reliable for you to go to work and donate the extra money away. So that's what this looks like, right? Probably this will be on like an annual approximately an annual basis and over time like as your discretionary income increases as you get like promotions raises etc um especially since you have a prestige prestigious um, degree you're going to increase the amount of money that you spend to these charities Thirdly, let's talk about what these highest paying jobs looks like. It looks different based off of like whatever major or interest that you've been pursuing throughout college, for example, right? So for instance, like if you're looking to be a doctor or nurse, you would take the highest paying position for that. Lastly, on charities, we think that this is going to be based on your individual preference. You're probably, you're going to do background checks and like um, decide which charity aligns most with your beliefs. Like, for instance, we don't think that you're going to donate to some like racist organization that funnels money to p political campaigns because we think it's fair to assume this person is reasonable, fairly moral person, especially if they're donating like all their discretionary income to charity. And this isn't limited to like national charities too. It could be like a smaller charity, for instance, like maybe donating to someone's family or someone that you know is struggling within your local community. It's not limited to like specifically an organization. Um, now moving on to the framework, right, because I think a lot of this debate comes down to framework and essentially how you view yourself over like society. We're going to say aside government that we think that like what is best for society outweighs what is best for you, especially because this debate is in the realm of discretionary funding. So you already have enough money for yourself. The reasoning for this, we're going to give you two reasons for this. Firstly, we think that like you have an obligation to other people as a human, because that's sort of like the purpose of life, right? Like imagine living a life where there was basically like no other people on earth except for you, right? Like life would be meaningless. Therefore, we ought to value like uh, your life or our own lives in terms of like our impacts and relationships with others. Second reason being that like we think that like because no one gets to choose their socioeconomic status, etc. And given that you're already in a really pr privileged privileged situation to even consider like going to one of these colleges and graduating there, you should aim to benefit those who weren't as privileged as you were starting off. So now we're gonna move into our case. Our first contention being that this charity money has a lot more benefit to others than you, right? And this is just basis on the basis of diminishing marginal returns, right? Like as a graduate of a prestigious university, you are literally in the top percentile of the nation. So you being able to go to a fancy restaurant every night doesn't bring you like much more happiness than ordering takeout at a slightly cheaper place, right? But what does really have an impact on your, on a, people's lives. It's like when you donate money to your local food pantry, that can mean the difference between starvation and a family being able to feed their kids, right? Like this has a much greater impact. This money could be used with like a lot more utility by someone else. We think that like charities in general are good at capturing local needs that a government can't effectively cover. Like for instance, if a government is corrupt, if there isn't enough like resources to do so. So like things like food banks, rape crisis centers, or mental health lines are really important. And we think that like you specifically putting money towards these charities, towards families that you care about, is going to have a much larger impact on them than it ever will have on you because you already have so much pr privilege on your life. Then we're going to move into our second contention, which is that you can do good with the position that you have, right? 
I think we have to be realistic here, because if you're graduating from a prestigious university, you're probably an extremely amb ambitious person in the first place to be even be able to get in that college, right? Like a lot of these colleges that we're talking about with prestigious universities, they have a culture of taking really high paying jobs, for instance, like finance culture at a lot of these schools. And a lot of times this is because these prestigious universities advertise like high starting salaries in the first place. They put you with connections to people to give you access to these same like high paying jobs, right? So note that like because of this, if you don't take this high paying position, someone else is going to get the same position that you are denying in like off world, right? Like you're denying the same high paying salary job that someone else in this prestigious university is going to be able to get, right? But what isn't symmetric is that this other person probably isn't going to give all their discretionary money to charity though, right? Like, because there really just isn't a culture for like donating all your discretionary funding to charity, especially at this level of privilege. Like basically the only culture that we get for donating is for um, people donating to colleges, rich people donating to colleges so that like their kids can go to Yale, like, like we've seen in the past, right? There isn't a culture for donating all, donating all your money to charity. So you as an individual, by taking this opportunity to take a high paying job, which, um, and also just like donating all of your money to charity out of your own goodwill is going to be really unique. You're gonna be in a unique position. So because of this on side government, we get the unique benefits of benefiting charities, giving them the money and resources when someone else in your position wouldn't likely do so. Our last contention is about your own personal happiness, right? Because we know like psychologically, when you do good, you feel good. That when you give money and spend things on others, you're likely going to feel better. You're probably going to connect with these same like marginalized people that you're giving money to. It's going to make you more connected to the real world. And um, especially because you're not going to be in these privileged circles all the time, you're likely going to become like more progressive and care about these people more. And we think that like, because you are in a prestigious university, you probably enjoy doing a lot of work. So you enjoy your high paying job um, and you also are able to benefit others at the same time. For these reasons, we are so proud to propose. Okay, so the order of my speech is going to be our two contentions and then I'll go um, respond to their framework and then their three contentions in the order it was read. Are there any questions on the order or is anyone not ready? Will you be touching on definitions? Um, not strictly, like specifically, like addressing the definitions, but a lot of the like background knowledge that they brought up, we will be addressing. Like, do I need another sheet for topicality? Oh, no. Okay. My time starts now. I strongly negate the resolution you should accept the highest paying job you are offered and then donate your discretional income to charity. Our first contention is going to be on how charities are actually bad. Our first point is that it absolves the government of responsibility. Charity allows the state to escape some of its responsibilities. Large scale philanthropy to support essential services is wrong. Charity to support essential services is bad because it switches provision from government to charity rather than increasing benefits to the needy in the first place. If the charity sector increases spending in an area, also funded by the government, then there is a risk that the government will choose to spend less in that area with the result that governments save money and extra benefits provided by the charity spent are reduced. This means that while the issues may be addressed in the short term, the lack of federal infrastructure and planning that comes with federal funding exacerbates the issue long term, which results in massive harm for a massive amount of people. Take the issue of cancer research. According to Cancer Health, federal funding for cancer research is inversely proportional to how much charitable donations go towards cancer research. Just last year, the National Cancer Institute faced a 559 million or 9% cut the problem with this is that a reliance on charity can cripple organizations, while government funding allots a set amount of money each year. Charity funding is variable. Thus, an overt reliance on this, which we are seeing in the status quo, allows for these issues to remain issues well into the extended future and threatens to cripple good causes. Our second point here is that charities lack general infrastructure. A prime example of this is, to, is the World Bank's billion dollar effort to improve water access to the country of Tanzania. While it was certainly a noble goal, it generated a stunning lack of success due to a fundamental lack of planning that would have been solved if the government had been in charge of the operation. 
Our second point under charities is lack of accountability. According to professors in organizational behavior, George Newman and uh, Dalen Kane of Yale University, a study in this month's issue of psychological science illustrates that heads of charitable donations often take home more profit than they actually donate. For example, former head of a for-profit company that raised money for AIDS research and other causes pocketed enormous amounts of money donated, earning a whopping 400 a uh, thousand per year. Charitable donations are not guaranteed to legitimately support the cause that you were donating. Before this was revealed in an investigative report by the New York Times, donors didn't know that their money was not legitimately going towards AIDS research and other causes. Now the impacts of this is, um, First of all, money lost, which leads to a decreased quality of life. When this money is being wasted, it's not going to the people that it needs to go to. It's not um, going to the people that need it the most and overall leading to a decreased quality of life. Our second impact is there's even less support for charities on the government uh, level because it has led to hand washing because they aren't putting in as much support because supposedly the charities are taking care of it. Um, this is a long-term issue here. The impact here is long-term because we are basically not incentivizing the government to actually create the infrastructure to long-term sustain these issues in the first place. Now let's move on to our second contention about uh, general choice. Our first point here is that startups and businesses are key for the economy. Startups create new markets or completely transform old markets by introducing products that change the world. New technologies often create new opportunities that startups take advantage. Startups then create a massive value over mature businesses, inspiring competition and disrupting the economy to evolve. So we see that most successful startups are fueled by graduates of prestigious universities. Looks in fact that most big tech companies were started by prestigious college grads or the attendees like Mark Zuckerberg. However, a startup would never be the highest paying job per the resolution. 89% of Fortune 100 CEOs graduated, or sorry, 11% of um, uh, Fortune 100 CEOs attended prestigious Ivy League schools. This is because, um, however, a lot of them um, just chose to, uh, especially recently, go down the corporate path. This is because of the pressure placed on prestigious students to go down the path of corporations and making money, instead of fostering a creative mindset to take a non-traditional route after college. We see that the most successful startups are started by people that went to prestigious universities, but less and less of them are actually going down this route because of this pressure that the, um, the choice we're debating here is actually causing. Our second point under this is that it deters from further education. When the only option granted after graduation is seen as being a corporate job, this means that seeking out a PhD or higher learning in order to conduct research is not seen as desirable. The NSF found that when looking at institutional rankings, some important statistics are revealed. In fact, nine out of the top 20 institutions of um, SE doctorates recipients are liberal, small liberal arts colleges and um, 10 uh, big state research institutions and only four are from Ivy League institutions. The reason for this being that corporations immediately offer high paying jobs right out of undergrad, giving them less incentive to further their education and learning, forcing an individual to pursue a high paying job despite the proven decrease in educa educational attainment reduces quality of life. Our B point here is that research and development is key for the future. Having more prestigious uh, students contributing to research and development later on in their academic career instead of sooner would greatly improve the U.S. tech and pharmaceutical industry, according to Reuters. The impact of this is that it solves for things like vaccines and cancer research, be cancer research because instead of just joining like a corporation that's probably you know bad for the environment and does all these things and then just donating the leftover money to another corrupt corporation you can actually the better choice is to wait take a lower paying job or go back to school get a higher degree and actually contribute to research that is going to benefit these issues like vaccines and cancer research and other charitable things while working on that and actually improving society. And we also see that with more startups, there's a better, more diverse economy and more innovation leads to an overall better economy and a better quality of life. Now on to the affirmation side of the flow. So first I'd like to address the point about how they said that like people that go to prestigious universities have no debt. However, this is not true, especially for middle-class families that often don't qualify for financial aid, but are still struggling to pay off their debts. According to the Department of Education's college scorecard, students who graduated or withdrew in 2017 or 2018 from elite or highly selective colleges and graduate programs owed about 12% of all student debt in those years, but only account for 4% of all borrowers. Now, they also state, try to state that um, people will have to choose a charity that aligns with their beliefs. But we believe that, first of all, this is extra topical. Background checks for charities are not a part of the resolution. Second, good charities can actually divert lots of money to their CEOs, look to our entire disadvantage. A lot of times it's hard to tell whether these organizations are corrupt or not in the first place. 
Okay, now on to their first point about benefiting others. This is simply not true if your money is being squandered in the first place and actually leading to um, corrupt organizations getting money and the government not giving support. And in response to their second uh, contention, it is a culture to donate this money among households in the top 5% of the income distributions, those earning more than 20 uh, 200,000 per year, 91% um, of them made at least one donation a year. And it's already a, a norm. Most rich legacy students already donate money for charity because of, um, yeah, because it's a general norm there. And overall, like when you're d donating to a corrupt, uh, per like corrupt institution, it's going to be bad for personal happiness. And you're also like basically forcing yourself to take a job for money rather than if you actually like the job or not, which is ultimately going to be worse. So for those reasons, I urge a negation ballot. All right. Um, okay. So the order is basically going to be neg case, then uh, af case. Um, oh, sorry. Top. Sorry. Top of case. Neg case. Af case. Um, so if there's no questions or anything, I'll start in three, two, one. All right. So let's first um, address um, a couple of issues at the top of uh, the case. Um, so for like the points that they brought up about how like we can't like assume that like they're definitely going to do background checks, uh, we think it's like well yes like there's definitely a possibility that the person isn't go won't do background checks. We think it's fairly reasonable to assume that they will because again, graduating from a prestigious university, you're probably a very diligent person, and because we like according to this resolution, like you're planning to spend the rest of your life donating a lot of money to charity, chances are you're going to want to do research into exactly how you're doing that before you do it. So I think it's fair to assume that you're going to do a, quite a bit of research before you donate. Um, we'd also like to make it clear that like, while yes, there are some like corrupt charities, most charities are not are not terrible. And even if there's like, this, like the leaders of the charities are taking a little more money than they should, it's not a huge deal. Um, because the majority of that money is still going towards a good cause and also like there's a lot of more like local ch and smaller charities um like like local like rape crisis centers for example um where they like um w which are like much more um likely to not have corruption and much and like you can also like donate to there's a lot of like local charities local environmental organizations anything like that um okay so so yeah so now that that's out of the way let's go into the segues pretty well into their first contention about how charities are bad um, so we'd like to first point out that like, we'd like to make it very clear that like, remember, this is just one person. They probably don't have, there's very, very minimal chance that they're going to make the same money as like billionaires like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or anyone like that, right? They're not going to be making a lot of money to the point where how they're spending it is actually having any significant effect on government policy. So like all these points about how like, oh, like the government should be fulfilling the jobs of charities. Yeah, that's th those points are great and all, but the problem is that you're not actually making an influence on government policy because you're just one person who does not who is not a bazillionaire, right? Um, and the and like we can and so like we can see that like this like a, pretty much most of this contention like all of those points about how like th this is the government's job don't really stand. Um, so now let's um, so now let's move on down to um, and also I'd like to make it clear that like like um, also like. The problem right now is that like let's say you don't donate to these charities like this these problems that these charities are addressing won't the government sudden won't suddenly say hey i'm going to donate to this charity in place of you that problem's just going to sit there and that family is not going to be getting their food because the government isn't going to just suddenly say hey this one person isn't donating to charity i'll pick up the slack so you can see that like that like this isn't actually like not donating to charity doesn't actually incentivize the government to do anything when you're not like Jeff Bezos, for example. And even if you're Jeff Bezos, it probably wouldn't incentivize the government to do anything. Um, and like, we'd also like to point out that like these like short term impacts of your money are pretty huge. Like whether or not a family can get food for an, for like an evening is really, really important to a lot of families. Um, now let's also go on to like their second part of this contention, which is about how like there's not a lot of accountability and there's corruption in the leadership of these charities. Um, we'd like to point out that like a like um, as I already mentioned, like a lot of these um, a lot of these charities that are local have a lot less of this corruption, and like because you're doing background checks, you'll be able to tell if like a charity is like super corrupt or anything. Um, but we think that like even if you're donating to a charity like the like the one in their example that where their leader made four hundred thousand dollars a year, like let's say you're donating to that charity, we still think that like the vast majority of your money that you're donating to that charity is not going towards that CEO's pay uh, 
uh, banking account. That money is the vast majority of that money is going to like those AIDS victims, to all of the people that you're that the charity is supposed to be helping. So then that like that's a much more you're doing like much much more for your um your for the community in our world and in their world, even if you're donating to a somewhat corrupt charity. Um, so we can see that like you're still having a much greater impact on people's lives in our worlds. Um, and like also like all these points about how like the government should be doing this, we'd like also like to add that like the government can also be corrupt in, as well. Like they can also misspend money. Like the World Bank bank example, there's not much of a reason to indicate that like this money wouldn't have been misspent if it was given to some sort of government body. Um, that that's like infrastructure would have been better if it, if like some government body did it instead of the World Bank. Um, so now let's, but anyways, let's move on to their second contention about how like you can, about how like there's better, like there's like alternative options. So like first let's deal with the startups idea. So we'd like to point out that like startups are also extremely risky. And like, that means if like you don't succeed, not only will you not have like, that like, like you risk your, you yourself not having any discretionary income, which is really, really bad. Right. We think, um, and we think that's like a really bad risk that you don't want to take, especially considering that like there's already been a huge boom in startups. So there's not much room left for even more startups. Um, and it's again, it's a very high risk thing that you wanted that you would do. And it's really like startups are really only started by people who have like the disposable income or like rich parents to start with, um, which is not true of the average graduate. So we think that it's very unlikely that like making a startup would actually even make you more money, just you yourself, than our world. Um, and now like also then to their other point about how like corporations offer high paying jobs so people won't do cancer research. So we think that like A, like this if this person might not even be going into a field like that has like that has like research opportunities to begin with, not a lot of like they're not like there's no guarantee that this person even like was in majoring in something that's related to cancer research. But even if like you do end up doing like do end up missing out on like cancer research, for example, the chances of you of you specifically having a like having a significant impact on cancer research by staying in school for a little longer is actually pretty dang minimal considering the extraordinary amount of resources we've already poured into cancer research without too many successes. So we don't think that like your individual contribution will have a huge impact here, but where it will have a huge impact is when you're donating it to, to charities that provide people with the day-to-day -day food and um, food and water and, and, ne and necessities that they're not getting otherwise. Um, so now let's go back into our case. Um, so they bring up these points about how like you can have a lot of debt if you graduate from a prestigious university. Um, but we don't think this is like a huge issue. Like the issue of debt is actually that big in this debate, quite frankly, just because like realistically speaking, like you're going to be paying off your debt at the same rate in either world, if not faster in our world, because you're getting a high payer job and like you, um, discretionary income, like you, you need to pay off debt. So debt does not like factor into that. You're paying off debt. You're paying off debt in both worlds. That's not a problem here. Um, let's move on to the second contention about how, um, let's go, move on to the second contention where they talk about there's, how there's this culture of donating to charities. And we think that's actually false because while yes, like maybe like 91% of people like do have like small donations, what we actually see is that when you actually look at the amount of money rich people are donating, we actually see that poorer people have a tendency to donate lar larger percentages of their income than richer people. So we can see that there really isn't a culture of actually donating substantial amounts of money to charities. And as we can like obviously assume from the fact that you're donating all of your discretionary income, it's pretty likely that you're donating a very substantial amount to these charities, far a far greater percentage than, I than either richer or poorer people generally donate to charity. Um, so we can see that you do, you are in an extremely unique um, position where you can um, donate to charity and like again like obviously like very few people donate their entire discretionary income to charity so you have a very you're in a scenario where you have a very unique impact you can have on the world and now let's finally go on to their uh, refutation to our third contention was which was basically just that like you might not like your job but we think that like we'd like to keep in mind that like you're making this decision after you've graduated and presumably you've chosen a major that you like enjoy and because like generally the jobs you the highest paying jobs you find are the ones that you're an expert in you probably will enjoy it because you probably enjoyed your major so we don't think this is a big issue thank you for your time Cool. The order is going to be the affirmative case, or sorry, the negative case and then the affirmative case. Awesome. If everyone is ready. Uh, hold on. Are you going top of space first? Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm not going to be touching on top of case. I think everything's been resolved there. I'm just going to go neg then F. Cool. Uh, is everyone ready? All right. 
My time begins now. Hello, my name is Kathy Kondersky, and today I strongly negate the resolution. Let's jump right into our first disadvantage about how charity is bad. They tell you that a single individual is not going to make a huge difference. But first of all, that means that their point about how this is good for others doesn't stand either. But refusing to contribute to something that creates long-term issues is unethical, even if your individual donation makes little difference. Contributing your talents elsewhere like a startup is the most ethical decision, and I'll get onto this later. But ultimately, there are numerous examples of where an individual donation can exacerbate a problem long term. Take the issue of Tom's shoes. While Tom's shoes seemed like a charitable option, ultimately if you buy Tom's shoes, another shoe is donated to an individual in a developing country. This destroyed local cobbling economies in these developing countries because it removed the necessity for people to buy like locally the, their shoes in their like local countries, which ultimately was really bad net like over a long period of time. You can see that an individual purchase of Tom's shoes directly correlated to substantial declines in like like cobbling industries that existed in these developing countries. So there's numerous instances other than the one I just described where an individual donation would be really harmful. Then they also tell you later on in their speech that you, quote, will be donating a substantial amount. So they essentially double turn themselves here. We're just going to assume that you will be donating a substantial amount, which means that you will be contributing significantly to companies and practices that ultimately exacerbate issues like cancer research long term. Extend the fact that my partner tells you that cancer research by the government literally, or cancer funding from the government literally dropped by $514 million in the last year alone, and this was directly correlated with an increase in charitable funding. Again, extend the fact that charitable funding is variable, which means that if you create industries that depend upon charity funding, which you are directly contributing to by donating substantial amounts of your money to charity, you're ultimately setting up these important institutions for failure. The impacts of this are much, much larger than any good that can result from your individual donation. Can they tell you the government can misspend money as well? Sure they can, but the government risks solving power losses and has greater stakes if they misspend the money than charities do. Charities are also held under less scrutiny. Look to the fact that it took an entire New York Times investigative report and study to uncover the fact the CEO of this AIDS organization was pocketing way more money than he was donating, whereas the government is constantly being analyzed. They have to like publish fiscal reports every year, so it's really difficult for that kind of corruption to exist in the government where it's rampant in these charities. So ultimately, yes, the government can misspend money, but it's much less probable. Then they tell you that not all of the money will go to the CEO. Sure, not all the money will go to the CEO, but on average, 35% went to the fundraisers in charity. This is from the New York Times again. So ultimately, sure, not all of it goes to the CEO, but substantial amounts on average do not actually go to the causes that these charities claim that they are helping. And even if it doesn't all go to the CEO, you're much better served, like directly putting your feet on the ground and either doing research to solve the problem or doing community service than contributing to these bad institutions. So ultimately, the impacts of long-term issues being exacerbated, again, look to the complete destabilization of cobbling industries in developing nations. These are really, really big impacts, and they simply outweigh any individual impact of donating to a charity. Now, the second advantage or so, the second disadvantage was that of choice. They tell you that startups are very risky and you risk not having any discretionary income. We have a couple responses here. First of all, aside from startups, jobs that don't pay as much are good for society. For example, being a teacher is good for society, but you aren't being paid a lot. Research doesn't pay well, but it's good for society. On in, in opposition to that, jobs that pay a lot, like consulting firms or finance, don't contribute a lot to society. So in terms of just net benefits and a pure cost benefit analysis, you have more to give to society if you go to high impact, low reward jobs and not high reward, low impact jobs like finance, which is probably the sector the resolution is talking about. They tell you the risk not having any discretionary income. Uh, most you, They tell you also that they're supposedly debt free so that we're assuming they have the money to start a startup because they literally tell you that they graduate debt free. Most prestigious people, most people who graduate from prestigious universities are probably going to be able to start a startup. Also, we're not saying that they pursue this startup indefinitely but they should explore what is the best option for them before immediately taking a high paying job that is proven to correlate with decreased educational output and generally low quality of life. So ultimately, even if they risk not having any discretionary income, they have a prestigious university degree that's not going to be a problem for them to find a job, even if they don't immediately take this high paying job offer. Also, the individual possibilities for good if you don't donate and instead decide to go into research, again, outweigh the charity ones. In a charity world, say you're you, the charity you picked was perfect and you feed a family for around a week. The, uh, the eventual like benefits of developing a like cure for cancer or an important medicinal like 
treatment is way bigger than the individual things you can do with charity. So by choosing not to take this high paying job and instead going into a sector that legitimately has big impact, you have a lot more possibility for change here. Then the AF keeps saying it's only one person, but then claim this charitable donation will change society. Ultimately, if you look at the world by world comparison, you're seeing the negative has much more possibility to garner actual change. Now let's move on to the affirmation side of the case. We tell you that, first of all, most people from, or they tell you that good charities can, sorry, they tell you that it's reasonable to assume the charity will align for your align with your beliefs. Even if you do perform a thorough background check, it took a diligent investigation by an investigative, like the New York Times to uncover corruption. So even if you do do a background check, there is no way to guarantee that your money is actually doing good things. And they tell you that most like charities are good. They talk about, they talk a lot about local charities. First of all, there's no way to fiat that you are going to be donating your money to a local charity. This is like completely extra topical. A hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money. Most go to big buzzword charities. If you are like a rich individual, you're probably very busy because you've taken this high paying job. You're not going to spend hours finding the perfect charity. You're going to go to charities that everyone knows about. These charities care about prestige. That's obvious because of the school they went to. So they'll, I mean, these individual care, these individuals care about prestige, which is evident because they went to a prestigious school. Therefore, they're going to donate to big charities because people know about these charities. And these charities are the most, are the ones that have the greatest likelihood of having their CEOs pocket like large amounts of money. Then onto their point about how the job will go to someone else. We already told you that it is culture to donate this money amongst households, amongst rich households. And they tell you that, well, they don't, they don't, um, they don't, uh, give large amounts of their income, sure, but if they're very wealthy individuals, those large amounts, even if, or those small amounts, even if it doesn't constitute like 25% of their income is still pretty significant. Yeah, well, I at all. Uh, I'll take your take it at the end, but I don't think I'm going to have time. Then they tell you that, uh, like, we shouldn't judge jobs based on like personal happiness. So we tell you that like jobs and high paying jobs are like really correlated with decreased happiness and ultimately like, like larger stress levels. And they, they come up with some non responsive response here. They tell you that ultimately these jobs, you're not guaranteed to have the same thing in a startup. But ultimately, if you know that your research or your work has a greater chance for doing good, you're going to ultimately be happier. I'll take your POI now. Um, don't you think that like donating all of your discretionary income, if you're like in that scenario where you're wealthy is a lot, has a lot more of an impact than like donating a very small amount. What do you mean donate? That's not, I mean, you're setting up a false dichotomy here. We're not advocating for donating small amounts either. We're advocating for going into high impact fields and not immediately going into a high paying job. That's not going to have a large impact on society. And then hand washing yourself and absolving yourself of any actual like change generation because you're just waving off that you've donated to charity. This removes any like personal responsibility as well as the government. So I'm not really sure I understand your question. Ultimately, we clearly outweigh the affirmation case here because our impacts of going into either research and development and not contributing to long-term destabilization for developing countries is ultimately better for the world writ large. For these reasons, I just strong vote for the negative. Okay, so for a quick off time roadmap, I am not going to be going exactly like point by point. I'm going to do more general weighing and voters and some clarifications. So are there any questions on that? It's probably better to just flow this on an entirely new sheet if you're okay with that. Okay, that being said, time starts now on the affirmation side they have basically two points their first is that somehow charities even though they're corrupt are going to be helping people and their second is about personal happiness first on the her personal happiness we see that we ultimately solve better for personal happiness my partner tells you and i tell you in our responses that we tell you that high paying jobs are more stressful you have less happiness going into these jobs especially when you're going into these jobs just because it is high paying ultimately if you choose a job not because of the pay or the amount it is like gonna give you but more for if you think it's going to be impactful society and you are actually passionate about the job that's ultimately going to be infinitely better for personal happiness and on the negation side of the case, we have the issue of ch uh, charities and handwashing leading to less government support overall. And our second point about how academics and startups are ultimately going to have a greater impact. Now we see that we outweigh on magnitude here. 
Ultimately, the impact of a good startup is way more than any amount of money being put in place to a charity. Also, a lifetime of teaching or some other like um, less income, more better for society job is going to have a greater impact here. We have a bigger magnitude of social change. So even though they might come up and tell you that there's a low probability of a good startup working, we see that we should be preferring magnitude over probability here. First of all, probability is often wrong and risk analysis can be false. Higher magnitude is easier to quantify and it leads to less judge intervention. Our second weighing point is going to be on time frame. This is a big thing to consider here, considering all of the affirmations impacts are all short term, right? It's like, okay, you're, some charity is going to go to some corrupt nation, uh, some corrupt uh, organization, and some of that money is going to possibly help out versus the impact of actually putting in a government in infrastructure that's going to lead to long term effects here. So it's going to be creating more change on the long run. Magnitude, again, precedes probability. The existence of life and economics existing is a prior question to determining if quality of life exists. Now on some basic clarification points. So we hear, see here that it's going back and forth on whether it's about the individual or it's about how that individual contributes to society overall. First of all, like what an individual does also sets a norm, especially if they're in a prestigious university, but they keep going back and forth. So I'm going to talk about both of these. Um, so no matter which way they try to say it is in the last speech, we are still winning either way. So the first is on individuals. It's very clear here that you're going to have better personal happiness if you're actually going into a job that helps society that you are passionate about because a lifetime of teaching is ultimately going to be better than, again, like feeding um like people that can't afford food for a week, you're ultimately going into a job that is also benefiting society and it's directly fulfilling. You're not entirely as fulfilled by donating to a corrupt charity. So we're clearly winning if you consider the individual implications. And next on a societal level, we'll, we see that we're much better for society in general because we're promoting better government infrastructure. We're also bettering the impact on society by taking a job that we're generally passionate about that's not just high paying. Also, don't let them come up and say that high paying jobs could be like a good choice because like either way, the resolution says to choose that job specifically because it is a high paying job. Like they can't come up and say that, oh, what if the high paying job, like you're passionate about it. That's not the reason why you're choosing it. You're choosing it because of money. And because you're making that choice because of money, it's not going to lead to personal happiness. This brings me to my two voters. Our, my first voter, voter is that it's better to choose a job you like to do that you will think will change and help society no matter what field you are in. No matter if you are in the science field and you're helping make more medicine or you're in liberal arts and you're going into some institution to like, um, you know, like either teach or like make books or something, it's generally more fulfilling. There are other ways to contribute to society aside from just giving money to charity. Second, it comes down to, the, uh, to weighing between discretionary income versus a lifetime of fulfilling work that is probably better for society. We outweigh on both magnitude and time frame and it's clear negation ballot. All right, I'll be doing something similar, looking at some of the major things that have happened and also responding to some new arguments made in Oplock. That sounds good. Okay, since side opposition hasn't contested our framework, I think we have to, in the end, consider impacts that um, to society matter more than to you individually, right? So like the marginal arguments about like happiness that you have fulfillment, etc., don't really matter and aren't really voter issues in this round. But what we really have to look at firstly is whether or not charities themselves are good, right? We've gotten a lot of clash out of this. We don't think side opposition really engages with some of the links that we've provided insofar as like, like they don't recognize that governments can also be incredibly like inefficient, corrupt, racist at times, and don't always care about like the least advantage. Like extend our analysis that like charities can cover places that the government can't because of like lobbying or like conservatives trying to worsen like healthcare access etc right so like charities can help no, short term harms like providing food banks no, I'll stop time. yeah i can stop yeah. time all right so although the argument that uh governments can also be corrupt is not new the argument that charities can specifically account for areas the government can't has not been articulated before and so i ask that it be struck from the flow Okay, yeah, it was actually in my first speech. Let me respond to that. Like I mentioned specifically in my first contention about how charity has like benefit um, others to you in my, one of my sub points was that like ch charities in, are generally like good at covering local needs that governments just can't cover if the government is corrupt and if there isn't enough resources, et cetera. But 
up to judge's discretion. Okay. Uh, sorry, can you just quickly repeat where that is in the flow? Yeah, it should be under first contention in my speech where I mentioned that charities are in general good at capturing local needs that governments don't effectively cover, for instance, like corruption or if they, the government doesn't have enough resources. Yeah, under consideration. Go ahead. Okay. So furthermore, we think that like charities helping with short term like harms, like providing food banks and basic necessities to like states where like welfare just sucks or like donating to provide justice to the same people affected by like a racist and inequitable justice system are things that are like on net benefit, a benefit to like these um, benefit uh, that like charities have themselves, right? Like we think that like in general, if you are a person that is going to be donating for the rest of your life, you definitely like have time to figure out which charities are good. You're smart enough to be able to understand how the economy works probably. So you're going to donate to charities that have a benefit to other like places, economies, right? Then on this idea of like transparency, right? Like on this idea of like if charities are necessarily better than the government, we don't necessarily think there's a huge difference here. Look to the fact that like the Trump administrators people were like spending money on fancy diners and private jets like out of nowhere. So like there isn't really any link as to how the government is necessarily like so much better than others. Then let's go into the second question that we have is like, is your donation going to have like a large impact on government policy, right? Extend our analysis, like Peter said in his speech, right? Because you're only one person, you donating money isn't going to have a large effect on like government policy, right? But what is going to have a difference is when your individual donation goes to people who need it most, right? When you give money to a food bank to people that actually need it, it's going to have a large effect on those individual people. But your donation overall as a whole isn't going to have a large effect on government policy. What does have an effect is like when people like lobby and like, uh, funnel a bunch of money to charities because they're like conservatives and also trying to like not voting for healthcare and government funding. But like because you are probably progressive and like are care a lot about these individuals and are involved in like charity, you're probably not going to like um, start voting all of a sudden in a different direction, right? That's not going to change on either world. Then let's go into the last part which is like, what impact are, are you going to have in like either world, right? Because the comparative here is that on one world, you take a high paying job and you pay a lot of money towards charities that are going to do good because you care about researching them beforehand. And the other um, comparative that side opposition brings you is that you're going to all of a sudden get involved in startups or take a job that just pays less for the good of society, right? A few things on this, right? Especially since this was mostly developed um, in the op block. We think that like you can still extend our analysis that either way this high paying job is going to be taken by someone who like um, by the um, being taken by someone else, right? And this other person isn't going to care nearly as much as donating the charities than you do, um, especially because there isn't a culture for donating. Like, like we've mentioned, like rich people actually don't do donate that much proportionally. They only donate to the extent that like it helps them, which of oftentimes doesn't mean much, right? But if furthermore, we think that like it's very low probability that you're going to become a teacher to low income students out of Harvard, right? Just like look at the status quo and how these people are like uh, funneled into jobs and the types of connections that they get, right? Like you can't just like realistically claim all of a sudden you're going to become a teacher to low income students, right? Furthermore, like these jobs can already be taken to these individuals people. And also their argument about like how you're going to go into finance and hurt a bunch of people is probably like only low probability and only happens if you like actually majored in finance, right? Lastly, let's go into this idea that final final different comparative about this whole idea about taking up startup or doing some job that is going to be like um, all of a sudden like beneficial to society all of a sudden. We don't actually think that like startups are uh, it should be weighed that much in this round simply because they have they're really risky like startups themselves are like really risky and oftentimes succeeding in them means that you have like uber rich parents that can pay for your rent for like five years when you're on like basically no income so you're probably going to harm yourself in that way we think it's much better for you to funnel money towards people that need it specifically families in your local community or charities that you care about instead of just um, going your own path and taking a selfish path Okay, as soon as all the competitors are ready, I am.
Okay. So um, I'm going to read you my RFD. Um, so I uh, voted in favor of the opposition. Um, I feel like they gave me a clear-cut reason uh, why to vote for them under the government framework, which I thought was really cool. Um, but the Gov uh, didn't ever really give me anything that I felt was impactful enough for me to be able to apply it um, to really anything. Um, whenever I don't have a framework to go off of, I typically resort specifically to on balance. Um, and being that the framework was dropped by the Gov in the second speech, I never heard it brought up. Um, by the time that it was brought up in the third speech, it became a little bit of a problem because I can't evaluate something that's not been flown throughout the round. So in regards to the framework, I didn't favor that in favor of the Gov. Um, but regardless, um, I did favor it in favor of the opposition because they picked it up um, and floated exponentially well, I believe, uh, throughout the uh, round. Um, I feel like the opposition extended the framework um, on their side of the flow throughout. And as a result, I buy the framework of uh, best, uh, the best for society uh, falling in favor of the opposition based on the flow for a couple of reasons. So first, I buy the opposition's analysis that uh, the best thing for society would be to go into a field that uh, you want to, uh, because like, let's just face it, you're better at things that you want to do. Um, and the Gov focused entirely on the aspect of donating to charity and never really gave me much to address the idea that a person should accept a higher paying job. There were two aspects, I believe, of the burden of proof within this resolution. Um, and that's not something that I saw happen from the uh, Gov within the round. So it was an uh, excellent execution by the opposition to sort of attack that. Um, and the Gov does tell me that I should favor uh, higher paying jobs specifically because they're inherently good for other people, but like, okay, cool. Why do I care about other people? I never really hear that impacted out within the round. Um, so the second one, I buy the opposition analysis that charities lack the inherent infrastructure to be effective in helping people. Um, this largely doesn't really get refuted by the gov. Instead, they, fo they focus primarily on the idea of embezzlement. And in the second speech, the subpoint A under contention one of the AF goes completely dropped by the Gov. Um, so I don't really hear a response in that rebuttal speech. So by the time that the Gov third speech rolls around, there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, now I really do feel like this was the best executed round that I've judged all tournament. It was a really fun round um, and I did enjoy that. Uh, however, those are some of the reasons why I voted in the way that I did. I also feel like um, in the second speech specifically, the opposition really like I think I put on the ballot that the opposition opened up a flamethrower because it was like there was a lot of stuff that I really valued on the flow for the things that were being said in terms of the impacts um, that you'll see on the ballot because we just strictly don't have enough time to go through all of it. Um, but I specifically liked toward the middle of the speech whenever you started using the uh, framework that the government had introduced and started talking about what's best for society or things like teachers, things along these other lines, and you started giving other implementations where um, it would be better served. So I really, really very much enjoyed that analysis, uh, specifically because I think from the wording of this resolution, again, you had to, that the government had to prove two burdens. Um, and while they proved the latter burden, they really needed to prove the first burden to be able to access that. So I feel like attacking them on that aspect of it was absolutely excellently, um, done. And that's just a few of the reasons why I voted in the way that I did. You can see the rest on the ballot.